Chapter One of A Texas Matchmaker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas. A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. Chapter One Lance Lovelace. When I first found employment with Lance Lovelace, a Texas cowman, I had not yet attained my majority, while he was over sixty. Though not a native of Texas, Uncle Lance was entitled to be classed amongst its pioneers, his parents having emigrated from Tennessee along with a party of Stephen F. Austin's colonists in 1821. The colony with which his people reached the state landed at Quintana at the mouth of the Brazos River, and shared the various hardships that befell all the early Texas settlers, moving inland later to a more healthy locality. Thus the education of young Lovelace was one of privation. Like other boys in pioneer families, he became in turn a hewer of wood, or a drawer of water, as the necessities of the household required, in reclaiming the wilderness. When Austin hoisted the newborn Lone Star flag and called upon the sturdy pioneers to defend it, the adventurous settlers came from every quarter of the territory, and among the first who responded to the call of arms was young Lance Lovelace. After San Jacinto, when the fighting was over and the victory won, he laid down his arms and returned to ranching with the same zeal and energy. The first legislature assembled voted to those who bore arms in behalf of the new republic lands in payment for their services with this land script for his pay young lovelace in company with others set out for the territory lying south of the nueces they were a band of daring spirits the country was primitive and fascinated them and they remained some settled on the frio river though the majority crossed the nueces many going as far south as the Rio Grande. The country was as large as the men were daring, and there was elbow room for all and to spare. Lance Lovelace located a ranch a few miles south of the Nueces River, and from the cooing of the dubs in the Encinal, named it Las Palomas. When I first settled here in 1838, said Uncle Lance to me one morning, as we rode out across the range, my nearest neighbor lived forty miles up the river at Fort Yule. Of course, there were some Mexican families nearer, north on the Frio, but they don't count. Say, Tom, but she was a pretty country then. Why, from those hills yonder, any morning you could see a thousand antelope in a band going into the river to drink. And wild turkeys? Well, the first few years we lived here, whole flocks roosted every night in that farther point of the Encinal. And in the winter, these prairies were just flooded with geese and brant. If you wanted venison, all you had to do was to ride through those mesquite thickets north of the river to jump a hundred deer in a morning's ride. Oh, I tell you, she was a land of plenty. The pioneers of Texas belong to a day and generation which is almost gone. If strong arms and daring spirits were required to conquer the wilderness, nature seemed generous in the supply for nearly all were stalwart types of the inland Viking. Lance Lovelace, when I first met him, would have passed for a man in middle life. Over six feet in height, with a rugged constitution, he little felt his threescore years, having spent his entire lifetime in the outdoor occupation of a ranchman. Living on the wild game of the country, sleeping on the ground by a campfire, when his work required it, as much at home in the saddle as by his ranch fireside, he was a romantic type of the strenuous pioneer. He was a man of simple tastes, true as tested steel in his friendships, with a simple honest mind which followed truth and right as unerringly as gravitation. In his domestic affairs, however, he was unfortunate. The year after locating at Las Palomas, he had returned to his former home on the Colorado River where he had married Mary Bryan, also of the family of Austin colonists. 
Hopeful and happy, they returned to their new home on the Nueces, but before the first anniversary of their wedding day arrived, she, with her firstborn, was laid in the same grave. But grief does not kill, and the young husband bore her his loss as brave men do in living out their allotted day. But to the hour of his death, the memory of Mary Bryan mellowed him into a child, and when unoccupied, with every recurring thought of her or the mere mention of her name, he would fall into deep reverie, lasting sometimes for hours. Although he contracted two marriages afterward, they were simply marriages of convenience, to which after their termination he frequently referred flippantly, sometimes with irreverence, for they were unhappy alliances. On my arrival at Las Palomas, the only white woman on the ranch was Miss Jean, a spinster sister of its owner, and twenty years his junior. After his third bitter experience in the lottery of matrimony, evidently, he gave up hope and induced his sister to come out and preside as the mistress of Las Palomas. She was not tall like her brother, but rather plump for her forty years. She had large gray eyes with long black eyelashes, and she had a trick of looking out from under them which was both provoking and disconcerting, and no doubt many an admirer had been deceived by those same roguish, laughing eyes. Every man, Mexican and child on the ranch, was the devoted courtier of Miss Jean, for she was a lovable woman, and in spite of her isolated life and the constant plaguings of her brother on being a spinster, she fitted neatly into our pastoral life. It was these teasings of her brother that gave me my first inkling that the old ranchero was a wily matchmaker, though he religiously denied every such accusation. With a remarkable complacency, Jean Lovelace met and parried her tormentor, but her brother never tired of his hobby while there was a third person to listen. Though an unlettered man, Lance Lovelace had been a close observer of humanity. The big book of life had been always open before him and he had profited from its pages. With my advent at Las Palomas, there were less than a half a dozen books on the ranch, among them a copy of Bret Hart's poems and a large Bible. That book alone, said he to several of us one chilly evening, as we sat around the open fireplace, is the greatest treatise on humanity ever written. Go with me today in any city, in any country in Christendom, and I'll show you a man walk up the steps of his church on Sunday, who thanks God that he's better than his neighbor. But you needn't go so far if you don't want to. I reckon if I could see myself, I might show symptoms of it occasionally. Sis here thanks God daily that she is better than that Barnes girl who cut her out of Amos Alexander. Now don't you deny it, for you know it's gospel truth and that book is reliable on lots of other things. Take marriage, for instance. It is just as natural for men and women to mate at the proper time as it is for steers to shed in the spring. But there's no necessity of making all this fuss about it. The Bible way discounts all these modern methods. He took unto himself a wife is the way it describes such events. But now such an occurrence has to be announced months in advance, and after the wedding is over, in less than a year sometimes, they are glad to sneak off and get the bond dissolved in some divorce court, like I did with my second wife. All of us about the ranch, including Miss Jean, knew that the old ranchero's views on matrimony could be obtained by leading up to the question, or differing, as occasion required. So, just to hear him talk on his favorite theme, I said, Uncle Lance, you must recollect this is a different generation. Now I've read books. So have I, but it's different in real life. Now, in those novels you have read, the poor devil is nearly worried to death for fear he'll not get her. There's a hundred things happens. He's thrown off the scent one day and cuts it again the next, and one evening he's in a heaven of bliss, and before the dance ends, a rival looms up, and there's hell to pay. Excuse me, sis. But he gets her in the end and that's the way it goes in the books. But getting down to actual cases, when the money's on the table and the game's rolling, it's as simple as picking a sire and a dam 
to raise a racehorse. When they're both willing, it don't require any expert to see it. A one-eyed or a blind man can tell the symptoms. Now, when any of you boys get into that fix, get it over with as soon as possible. From the drift of your remarks, said June DeWeese very innocently, why wouldn't it be a good idea to go back to the old method of letting the parents make the matches? Yes, it would be a good idea. How in the name of common sense could you expect young sapheads like you boys to understand anything about a woman? I know what I'm talking about. A single woman never shows her true colors, but conceals her imperfections. The average man is not to be blamed if he fails to see through her smiles and Sunday humor. Now I was forty when I married the second time, and forty-five the last whirl. Looks like I'd had some little sense now, don't it? But I didn't. No, I didn't have any more show than a snowball in. Sis, hadn't you better retire? You're not interested in my talk to these boys. Well, if ever any of you want to get married, you have my consent. You'd better get my opinion on her dimples when you do. Now, with my sixty-odd years, I'm worth listening to. I can take a cool, dispassionate view of a woman now and pick every good point about her, just as if she was a cow horse that I was buying for my own saddle. Miss Jean, who had a ready tongue for repartee, took advantage of the first opportunity to remark, Do you know, brother, matrimony is a subject that I always enjoy hearing discussed by such an oracle as yourself? But did it never occur to you what an unjust thing it was of Providence to reveal so much to your wisdom and conceal the same from us babes? It took some time for the gentle reproof to take effect, but Uncle Lance had an easy faculty for evading a question when it was contrary to his own views. Speaking of the wisdom of babes, said he, reminds me of what Felix York, an old thirty-six comrade of mine, once said. He had caught the gold fever in forty-nine, and nothing would do, but he and some others must go to California. The party went up to Independence, Missouri, where they got into an overland immigrant train bound for the land of gold. But it seems before starting, Senator Benton had made a speech in that town, in which he made the prophecy that one day there would be a railroad connecting the Missouri River with the Pacific Ocean. Felix told me this only a few years ago, but he said that all the Teamsters made the prediction a byword. When crossing some of the mountain ranges, the train halted to let the oxen blow, one bullwhacker would say to another, Well, I'd like to see old Tom Benton get his railroad over this mountain. When Felix told me this, he said, There's a railroad today crosses those same mountain passes over which we forty-niners whacked our bulls and to think I was a grown man, and had no more sense or foresight than a little baby blinking its eyes in the sun. With years at Las Palmas, I learned to like the old ranchero. There was something of the strong, primitive man about him, which compelled a youth of my years to listen to his counsel. His confidence in me was a compliment which I appreciate to this day. When I had been in his employ hardly two years, an incident occurred which, though only one of many similar acts cementing our long friendship, tested his trust. One morning, just as he was on the point of starting on horseback to the county seat to pay his taxes, a Mexican arrived at the ranch and announced that he had seen a large band of javelina on the border of the chaparral up the river. Uncle Lance had promised his taxes by a certain date, but he was a true sportsman and owned a fine pack of hounds. Moreover, the peccary is a migratory animal and does not wait upon the pleasure of the hunter. As I rode out from the corrals to learn what had brought the vaquero with such haste, the old ranchero cried, Here, Tom, you'll have to go to the county seat. Buckle this money belt under your shirt, and if you lack enough gold to cover the taxes, you'll find silver here in my saddlebags. Blow the horn, boys, and get the guns. Lead the way, Poncho. And say, Tom, better leave the road after crossing the Sordo, and strike through that mesquite country, he called back, as he swung into his saddle and started, leaving me a sixty-mile ride in his stead. 
His warning to leave the road after crossing the creek was timely, for a ranchman had been robbed by bandits on that road the month before. But I made the ride in safety before sunset, paying the taxes amounting to over a thousand dollars. During all of our acquaintance, extending over a period of twenty years, Lance Lovelace was a constant revelation to me, for he was original in all things. Knowing no precedent, he recognized none which had not the approval of his own conscience. Where others were content to follow, he blazed his own pathways, immaterial to him, whether they were followed by others or even noticed. In his business relations, and in his own way, he was exact himself and likewise exacting of others. Some there are who might criticize him for an episode which occurred about four years after my advent at Las Palomas. Mr. Whitley Booth, a younger man and a brother-in-law of the old ranchero by his first wife, rode into the ranch one evening, evidently on important business. He was not a frequent caller, for he was also a ranchman, living about forty miles north and west on the Frio River. But he was in the habit of bringing his family down to the Nueces about twice a year for a visit of from ten days to two weeks' duration. But this time, though we had been expecting the family for some little time, he came alone, remained overnight, and at breakfast ordered his horse, as if expecting to return at once. The two ranchmen were holding a conference in the sitting-room when a Mexican boy came to me at the corrals and said I was wanted in the house. On my presenting myself, my employer said, Tom, I want you as a witness to a business transaction. I'm lending wit here a thousand dollars, and as we have never taken any notes between us, I merely want you as a witness. Go into my room, please, and bring out from under my bed one of those largest bags of silver. The door was unlocked, and there, under the ranchero's bed, dust-covered, were possibly a dozen sacks of silver. Finding one tagged with the required amount, I brought it out and laid it on the table between the two men. But on my return I noticed Uncle Lance had turned his chair from the table and was gazing out of the window, apparently absorbed in thought. I saw at a glance that he was gazing into the past for I had become used to these reveries on his part. I had not been excused, and an embarrassed silence ensued, which was only broken as he looked over his shoulder and said, There it is, Wit. Count it if you want to. But Mr. Booth, knowing the oddities of Uncle Lance, hesitated. Well, why, look here, Lance. If you have any reason for not wanting to loan me this amount, why say so? There's the money, Wit. Take it if you want to. It'll pay for the hundred cows you are figuring on buying. But I was just thinking, can two men at our time in life, who had always been friends, afford to take the risk of letting a business transaction like this possibly make us enemies? You know I started poor here, and what I have made and saved is the work of my lifetime. You are welcome to the money, but if anything should happen that you didn't repay me, you know I wouldn't feel right towards you. It's probably my years that does it, but now I always look forward to the visits of your family and Jean, and I always enjoy our visits at your ranch. I think we'd be two old fools to allow anything to break up those pleasant relations. Uncle Lance turned in his chair, and looking into the downcast countenance of Mr. Booth, continued, Do you know, Wit, that youngest girl of yours reminds me of her aunt, my own Mary, in a hundred ways. I just love to have your girls tear around this old ranch, and they seem to give me back certain glimpses of my youth that are priceless to an old man. That'll do, Lance, said Mr. Booth, rising and extending his hand. I don't want the money now. Your view on the matter is right, and our friendship is worth more than a thousand cattle to me. Lizzie and the girls were anxious to come with me, and I'll go right back and send them down. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Shepherd's Ferry. Within a few months after my arrival at Las Palomas, 
there was a dance at Shepherd's Ferry. There was no necessity for an invitation to such local meets. Old and young alike were expected and welcome, and a dance naturally drained the sparsely settled community of its inhabitants from forty to fifty miles in every direction. On the Nueces in 1875, the amusements of the countryside were extremely limited. Barbecues, tournaments, and dancing covered the social side of ranch life and whether given up or down, our home river, or north on the Frio, so they were within a day's ride. The white element of Las Palomas could always be depended upon to be present, Uncle Lance in the lead. Shepherd's Ferry is somewhat of a misnomer, for the water in the river was never over knee-deep to a horse, except during freshets. There may have been a ferry there once, but from my advent on the river, there was nothing but a store, the keeper of which also conducted a roadhouse for the accommodation of travelers. There was a fine grove for picnic purposes within easy reach, which was also frequently used for camp meetings purposes. Gnarly old live oaks spread their branches like a canopy over everything, while the sea-green moss hung from every limb and twig, excluding the light and lazily waving with every vagrant breeze. The fact that these grounds were also used for camp meetings only proved the broad toleration of the people. On this occasion, I distinctly remember that Miss Jean introduced a lady to me who was the wife of an Episcopal minister, then visiting on a ranch near Oakville, and I danced several times with her and found her very amiable. On receipt of the news of the approaching dance at the ferry, we set the ranch in order. Fortunately, under seasonable conditions, work on the cattle range is never pressing. A program of work, outlined for a certain week, could easily be postponed a week or a fortnight, for that matter. For this was the land of La Manana, and the white element of Las Palomas easily adopted the easy-going methods of their Mexican neighbors. So on the day everything was in readiness. The ranch was a trifle over thirty miles from Shepherd's, which was a fair half-day's ride. But as Miss Jean always traveled by ambulance, it was necessary to give her an early start. Las Palomas raised fine horses and mules, and the ambulance team for the ranch consisted of four mealy-muzzled brown mules, which, being range-bred, made up an activity what they lacked in size. Tiburcio, a trusty Mexican, for years in the employ of Uncle Lance, was the driver of the ambulance, and at an early morning hour he and his mules were on their mettle and impatient to start. But Miss Jean had a hundred petty things to look after. The lunch, enough for a round-up, was prepared, and was safely stored under the driver's seat. Then there were her own personal effects and the necessary dressing and tidying, with Uncle Lance dogging her at every turn. "'Now, sis,' said he, "'I want you to rig yourself out in something sumptuous, because I expect to make a killing with you at this dance. I'm almost sure that that Louisiana mule-drover will be there. You know you made quite an impression on him when he was through here two years ago. Well, I'll take a hand in the game this time, and if there's any merry in him, He'll have to lead trumps. I'm getting tired of having my dear sister trifled with by every passing drover. Yes, I am. The next one that hangs around, Las Palomas, basking in your smiles, has got to declare his intentions, whether he buys mules or not. Oh, you've got a brother, sis, that'll look out for you. But you must play your part. Now, if that mule buyer is there, shall I? Why, certainly, brother. Invite him to the ranch, replied Miss Jean, as she busied herself with the preparations. It's so kind of you to look after me. I was listening to every word you said, and I've got my best bib and tucker in that hand box. And just you watch me dazzle that Mr. Mule Buyer. Strange you didn't tell me sooner about his being in the country. Here, take these boxes out to the ambulance, and say, I put in the middle-sized coffee pot. And do you think two packages of ground coffee will be enough? 
All right, then. Now, where's my gloves? We were all dancing attendance in getting the ambulance off, but Uncle Lance never relaxed his tormenting. Come now, hurry up, said he, as Jean and himself led the way to the gate where the conveyance stood waiting. For I want you to look your best this evening, and you'll be all tired out if you don't get a good rest before the dance begins. Now, in case the mule buyer don't show up, how about Sim Oliver? You see, I can put in a good word there just as easily as not. Of course, he's a widower like myself, but you're no spring pullet. He wouldn't class among the buds. Besides, Sim branded eleven hundred calves last year, and the very last time I was talking to him, he allowed he'd crowd thirteen hundred close this year. Big calf drop, you see. Now, just why he should go to the trouble to tell me all this, unless he had his eyes on you, is one too many for me. But if you want me to cut him out of your string of eligibles, say the word, and I'll chase him out. You just bet, little girl, whoever wins you has got to score right. Great Scott, but you've got good taste in selecting perfumery. Mmm, it makes me half drunk to walk alongside of you. Be sure and put some of that ointment on your kerchief when you get there. Really, said Miss Jean, as they reached the ambulance, I wish you had made a little memorandum of what I'm expected to do. I'm all in a flutter this morning, you see, without your help. My case is hopeless, but I think I'll try for the mule buyer. I'm getting tired looking at these slab-sided cowmen. Now, just look at those mules. Haven't had a harness on in a month, and Tiburcio can't hold four of them, no how. Lance, it looks like you'd send one of the boys to drive me down to the ferry. Why, Lord, love you, girl. Those mules are as gentle as kittens. And you don't suppose I'm going to put some gringo over a veteran like Tiburcio? Why, that old boy used to drive for Santa Ana during the invasion in 36. Besides, I'm sending Theodore and Glenn on horseback as a bodyguard. Las Palomas is putting her best foot forward this morning in giving you a stylish turnout, without riders in their Sunday livery. And those two boys are the best ropers on the ranch. So if the mules run off, just give one of your long, keen screams, and the boys will rope and hog-tie every mule in the team. Get in now, and don't make any faces about it. It was pettishness and not timidity that ailed Jean Lovelace, for a pioneer woman like herself had, of course, no fear of horse flesh. But the team was acting in a manner to unnerve an ordinary woman. With me clinging to the bits of the leaders, and a man each holding the wheelers, as they pawed the ground and surged about in their creaking harnesses, they were anything but gentle. But Miss Jean proudly took her seat. Tiburcio fingered the reins in placid contentment. There was a parting volley of admonitions from brother and sister. The latter was telling us where we would find our white shirts, when Uncle Lance signaled to us, and we sprang away from the team. The ambulance gave a lurch forward as the mules started on a run, but Tiburcio dexterously threw them on to a heavy bed of sand, poured the whip into them as they labored through it. They crossed the sand bed. Glen Gallup and Theodore Quayle, riding at their heads, pointed the team into the road, and they were off. The rest of us busied ourselves getting up saddle horses and dressing for the occasion. In the latter we had no little trouble, for dress occasions like this were rare with us. Miss Jean had been thoughtful enough to lay our clothes out, but there was a busy borrowing of collars and collar buttons, and the blackening of boots which made the sweat stand out on our foreheads in beads. After we were dressed and ready to start, Uncle Lance could not be induced to depart from his usual custom and wear his trousers outside his boots. Then we had to pull off the boots and polish them clear up to the ears in order to make him presentable. But we were in no particular hurry about starting, as we expected to out across the country and would overtake the ambulance at the mouth of the Arroyo Seco in time for the noonday lunch. There were six in our party, consisting of Dan Happersett, Aaron Scales, John Cotton, June DeWeese, Uncle Lance, and myself. 
With the exception of Deweese, who was nearly twenty-five years old, the remainders of the boys on the ranch were young fellows, several of whom, beside myself, had not yet attained their majority. On ranch work, in the absence of our employer, June was recognized as the Segundo of Las Palomas, owing to his age and his long employment on the ranch. He was a trustworthy man, and we younger lads entertained no envy towards him. It was about nine o'clock when we mounted our horses and started. We jollied along in a party, or separated into pairs in cross-country riding, covering about seven miles an hour. I remember, said Uncle Lance, as we were riding in a group, the first time I was ever at Shepherd's Ferry. We had been down the river on a cow hunt for about three weeks, and had run out of bacon. We had been eating beef and venison and antelope for a week until it didn't taste right any longer. So I sent the outfit on ahead and rode down to the store in the hope of getting a piece of bacon. Shepherd had just established the place at the time, and when I asked him if he had any bacon, he said he had. But is it good, I inquired, and before he could reply, an eight-year-old boy of his stepped between us, and throwing back his toe-head, looked up into my face and said, Mister, it's a little the best I ever tasted. Now, June, said Uncle Lance, as we rode along, I want you to let Henry Aneer's wife strictly alone tonight. You know what a stink it raised all along the river, just because you danced with her once last San Jacinto Day. Of course, Henry made a fool of himself by trying to borrow a six-shooter and otherwise getting on the prod, and I'll admit that it don't take the best of eyesight to see that his wife today thinks more of your old boots than she does of Aneer's wedding suit. Yet her husband will be the last man to know it. No man can figure to a certainty on a woman. Three guesses is not enough, for she will, and she won't, and she'll straddle the question or take the fence, and when you put a copper on her to win, she loses. God made them just that way, and I don't want to criticize his handiwork. But if my name is Lance Lovelace, and I'm sixty years old, and this is a chestnut horse that I'm riding, then Henry Aneer's wife is an unhappy woman. But that fact, son, don't give you license to stir up trouble between man and wife. Now remember, I've warned you not to dance, speak to, or even notice her on this occasion. The chances are that that local old fool will come healed this time, and if you give him any excuse, he may burn a little powder. June promised to keep on his good behavior, saying, That's just what I've made up my mind to do. But looky here, suppose he goes on the warpath, you can't expect me to show the white feather, nor let him run any sandies over me. I loved his wife once, and I'm not ashamed of it, and he knows it. As much as I want to obey you, Uncle Lance, if he attempts to stand up a bluff on me, just as sure as hell's hot, there'll be a strange face or two in heaven. I was a new man on the ranch, and unacquainted with the facts, so shortly afterwards I managed to drop to the rear with Dan Happersett, and got the particulars. It seems that June and Mrs. Anier had not only been sweethearts, but they had been engaged, and that the engagement had been broken within a month of the day set for their wedding, and that she had married Anier on a three weeks acquaintance. Little wonder Uncle Lance took occasion to read the riot act to his segundo, in the interest of peace. This was all news to me, but secretly I wished June courage and a good aim if it ever came to a showdown between them. We reached the Arroyo Seco by high noon, and found the ambulance in camp and the coffee pot boiling. Under the direction of Miss Jean, Tribercio had removed the seats from the conveyance so as to afford seating capacity for over half of our number. The lunch was spread out under an old live oak on the bank of the Nueces, making a cozy camp. Miss Jean had the happy knack of a good hostess. Our twenty-mile ride had whetted our appetites, and we did ample justice to her tempting spread. After luncheon was over, and while the team was being harnessed in, I noticed Miss Jean enticing Deweese off to one side, where the two held a whispered conversation, seated 
on an old fallen tree. As they returned, June was promising something which she had asked of him, and if there ever was a woman lived who could exact a promise that would be respected, Jean Lovelace was that woman, for she was like an elder sister to us all. In starting, the ambulance took the lead as before, and near the middle of the afternoon we reached the ferry. The merrymakers were assembling from every quarter, and on our arrival possibly a hundred had come, which number was doubled by the time the festivities began. We turned our saddle and work stock into a small pasture, and gave ourselves over to the fast-gathering crowd. I was delighted to see Miss Jean and Uncle Lance were accorded a warm welcome by everyone, for I was somewhat of a stray on this new range. But when it became known that I was a recent addition to Las Palomas, the welcome was extended to me, which I duly appreciated. The store in the hostelry did a rushing business during the evening hours, for the dance did not begin until seven. A Mexican orchestra, consisting of a violin, an Italian harp, and two guitars, had come up from Oakville to furnish the music for the occasion. Just before the dance commenced, I noticed Uncle Lance greet a late arrival, and on my inquiring of June who he might be, I learned that the man was Captain Frank Byler of Lagarto, the drover Uncle Lance had been teasing Miss Jean about in the morning, and a man, as I learned later, who drove herds of horses north on the trail during the summer, and during the winter drove mules and horses to Louisiana for sale among the planters. Captain Byler was a good-looking, middle-aged fellow, and I made up my mind at once that he was due to rank as the lion of the evening among the ladies. It is useless to describe this night of innocent revelry. It was a rustic community, and the people assembled were, with few exceptions, purely pastoral. There may have been earnest vows spoken under those spreading oaks, who knows? But if there were, the retentive ear which listened, and the cautious tongue which spake the vows, had no intentions of having their confidence profaned on this page. Yet it was a night long to be remembered. Timid lovers sat apart, oblivious to the gaze of the merry revelers. Matrons and maidens vied with each other in affability to the sterner sex. I had a most enjoyable time. I spoke Spanish well, and made it a point to cultivate the acquaintance of the leader of the orchestra. On his learning that I also played the violin, he promptly invited me to play a certain new waltz which he was desirous of learning. But I had no sooner taken the violin in my hand than the lazy rascal lighted a cigarette and strolled away, absenting himself for nearly an hour. But I was familiar with the simple dance music of the country, and played everything that was called for. My talent was quite a revelation to the boys of our ranch, and especially to the owner and mistress of Las Palomas. The latter had me play several old Colorado River favorites of hers, and I noticed that when she had the dashing Captain Byler for her partner, my waltzes seemed never long enough to suit her. After I had been relieved, Miss Jean introduced me to a number of nice girls, and for the remainder of the evening I had no lack of partners. But there was one girl there whom I had not been introduced to, who always avoided my glance when I looked at her, but who, when we were in the same set and I squeezed her hand, had blushed just too lovely. When that dance was over, I went to Miss Jean for an introduction, but she did not know her, so I appealed to Uncle Lance, for I knew that he could give the birth date of every girl present. We took a stroll through the crowd and when I described her by her big eyes, he said in a voice so loud that I felt she must hear, Why, certainly I know her. That's Esther McLeod. I've trotted her on my knee a hundred times. She's the youngest girl of old Donald McLeod, who used to ranch over on the mouth of the San Miguel, north of the Frio. Yes, I'll give you an interslaption. Then in a subdued tone, And if you can drop your rope on her, son, tie her good and fast for she's good stock. I was made acquainted as his last adopted son, and inferred the old ranchero's approbation by many a poke in the ribs from him in the intervals between dances, 
for Esther and I danced every dance together until dawn. No one could charge me with neglect or inattention, for I close-herded her like a hired hand. She mellowed nicely towards me after the ice was broken, and with the limited time at my disposal I made hay. When the dance broke up with the first signs of day, I saddled her horse and insisted her to mount, when I received the cutest little invitation, if I ever happened over on the San Miguel, to try and call. Instead of beating about the bush, I assured her bluntly that if she ever saw me on Miguel Creek, it would be intentional for I should have made the ride purely to see her. She blushed again in a way which sent a thrill through me. But on the Nueces in 75, if a fellow took a fancy to a girl, there was no harm in showing it or telling her so. I had been so absorbed during the latter part of the night that I had paid little attention to the rest of the Las Palomas outfit, though I occasionally caught sight of Miss Jean and the drover, generally dancing, sometimes promenading, and once had a glimpse of them tete-a-tete -tete on a rustic settee in a secluded corner. Our employer seldom danced, but kept his eyes on June DeWeese in the interest of peace, for Anir and his wife were both present. Once, while Esther and I were missing a dance over some light refreshment, I had occasion to watch June as he and Anir danced in the same set. I thought the latter acted rather surly though Deweese was the acme of geniality, and was apparently having the time of his life as he tripped through the mazes of the dance. Had I not known of the deadly enmity existing between them, I could never have suspected anything but friendship. He was acting the part so perfectly. But then I knew he had given his plighted word to the master and mistress, and nothing but an insult or indignity could tempt him to break it. On the return trip we got the ambulance off before sunrise, expecting to halt and breakfast again at the Arroyo Seco. Aaron Scales and Dan Happersett acted as couriers to Miss Jean's conveyance, while the rest dallied behind, for there was quite a cavalcade of young folk going a distance our way. This gave Uncle Lance a splendid chance to quiz the girls in the party. I was riding with a Miss Wilson from Ramarina, who had come up to make a visit at a nearby ranch, and incidentally attended the dance at Shepherd's. I admit that I was a little too much absorbed over another girl to be very entertaining, but Uncle Lance helped out by joining us. "'Nice morning overhead, Miss Wilson,' said he, on riding up. "'So I've waited just as long as I'm going to for that invitation to your wedding which you promised me last summer. Now I don't know so much about the young men down about Ramarina, but when I was a youngster, back on the Colorado, when a boy loved a girl, he married her, whether it was Friday or Monday, rain or shine. I'm getting tired of being put off with promises. Why, actually, I haven't been to a wedding in three years. What are we coming to? On reaching the road where Miss Wilson and her party separated from us, Uncle Lance returned to the charge. Now, no matter how busy I am, when I get your invitation, I don't care if the irons are in the fire and the cattle in the corral. I'll drown the fire and turn the cows out. And if La Palomas has a horse that'll carry me, I'll merely touch the high places in coming. And when I get there, I'm willing to do anything, give the bride away, say grace, or carve the turkey. And what's more, I never kissed a bride in my life that didn't have good luck. Tell your pa you saw me. Goodbye, dear. On overtaking the ambulance in camp, our party included about twenty, several of whom were young ladies. But Miss Jean insisted that every one remain for breakfast, assuring them that she had abundance for all. After the impromptu meal was disposed of, we bade our adieus and separated to the four quarters. Before we had gone far, Uncle Lance rode alongside of me and said, Tom, why didn't you tell me you was a fiddler? God knows you're lazy enough to be a good one, and you ought to be good on a bee course. But what made me warm to you last night was the way you built to Esther McLeod, son. You set her cush about right. If you can hold sight of a herd of beeves on a bad night like you did her, you'll be a foreman some day. 
and she's not only good blood herself, but she's got cattle and land. Old man Donald, her father, was killed in the Confederate army. He was an honest Scotsman who kept Sunday and everything else he could lay his hands on. In all my travels I never met a man who could offer a longer prayer or take a bigger drink of whiskey. I remember the first time I ever saw him. He was serving on the grand jury, and I was a witness in a cattle-stealing case. He was a stranger to me, and we had just sat down at the same table at a hotel for dinner. We were on the point of helping ourselves when the old Scot arose and struck the table a blow that made the dishes rattle. You heathens, said he, will you partake of the bounty of your heavenly father without returning thanks? We laid down our knives and forks like boys caught in a watermelon patch, and the old man asked a blessing. I've been at his house often. He was a good man, but secession caught him, and he never came back. So, Quirk, you see a son-in-law will be a handy man in the family, and with that start you made last night, I hope for good results. The other boys seemed to enjoy my embarrassment, but I said nothing in reply, being a new man with the outfit. We reached the ranch about an hour before noon, two hours in advance of the ambulance, and the sleeping we did until sunrise the next morning required no lullaby. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Las Palomas. There is something about those large ranches of southern Texas that reminds one of the old feudal system. The pathetic attachment to the soil of those born to certain Spanish land grants can only be compared to the European immigrant when, for the last time, he looks on the land of his birth before sailing. Of all this, La Palomas was typical. In the course of time, several such grants had been absorbed into its baronial acres, but it had always been the policy of Uncle Lance never to disturb the Mexican population. Rather, he encouraged them to remain in his service. Thus had sprung up around Las Palomas Ranch a little Mexican community, numbering about a dozen families, who lived in Wakals, close to the main ranch building. They were simple people, and rendered their new master a feudal loyalty. There were also several small ranchitas, located on the land, where under the Mexican regime they had been pretentious adobe buildings. A number of families still resided at these deserted ranches content in cultivating small fields or looking after flocks of goats and a few head of cattle, paying no rental save a service tenure to the new owner. The customs of these Mexican people were simple and primitive. They blindly accepted the religious teachings imposed with fire and sword by the Spanish conquerors upon their ancestors. A padre visited them yearly, christening the babes, marrying the youth, shriving the penitent, and saying masses for the repose of the souls of the departed. Their social customs were in many respects unique. For instance, in courtship, a young man was never allowed in the presence of his inamorata unless in company of others, or under the eye of a chaperone. Proposals, even among the nearest neighbors or most intimate of friends, were always made in writing, usually by the father of the young man, to the parents of the girl, but in the absence of such, by a godfather or a padrino. Fifteen days was the term allowed for a reply, and no matter how desirable the match might be, it was not accounted good taste to answer before the last day. The owner of Las Palomas was frequently called upon to act as padrino for his people and so successful had he always been that the vaqueros on his ranch preferred his service to those of their own fathers. There was scarcely a vaquero at the home ranch, but, in time past, had invoked his good offices in this matter, and he had come to be looked on as their patron saint. 
The month of September was usually the beginning of the branding season at Las Palomas. In conducting this work, Uncle Lance was the leader, and with the white element already enumerated, there were twelve to fifteen vaqueros included in the branding outfit. The dance at Shepherd's had delayed the beginning of active operations, and a large calf crop, to say nothing of horse and mule colts, now demanded our attention and promised several months' work. The year before, Las Palomas had branded over 4,000 calves, and the range was now dotted with the crop, awaiting the iron stamp of ownership. The range was an open one at the time, compelling us to work far beyond the limits of our employer's land. Fortified with our own commissary, and with six to eight horses apiece in our mount, we scoured the country for a radius of fifty miles. When approaching another range, it was our custom to send a courier in advance to inquire of the ranchero when it would be convenient for him to give us a rodeo. A day would be set when our outfit and the vaqueros of that range rounded up all the cattle watering at given points. Then we cut out the Las Palomas brand and held them under herd or started them for the home ranch, where the calves were to be branded. In this manner, we visited all the adjoining ranches, taking over a month to make the circuit of the ranges. In making the tour, the first range we worked was that of Ranchero Santa Maria, south of our range and on the head of the Terran Callas Creek. On approaching the ranch, as was customary, we prepared to encamp and ask for a rodeo. But in the choice of a vaquero to be dispatched on this mission, a spirited rivalry sprang up. When Uncle Lance learned that the rivalry amongst the vaqueros was meant to embarrass Enrique Lopez, who was also to Anita, the pretty daughter of the corporal of the Santa Maria, his matchmaking instincts came to the fore. Calling Enrique to one side, he made the vaquero confess that he had been playing for the favor of the senorita at Santa Maria. Then he dispatched Enrique on the mission, bidding him to carry the choicest compliments of Las Palomas to every don and donna of Santa Maria, and Enrique was quite capable of adding a few embellishments to the old matchmaker's extravagant flatteries. Enrique was in camp next morning, but at what hour of the night he had returned is unknown. The rodeo had been granted for the following day. There was a pressing invitation to Don Lance, unless he was willing to offend, to spend the idle day as the guest of Don Mateo. Enrique elaborated the invitation with a thousand adornments, but the owner of Las Palomas had lived nearly forty years among the Spanish-American people on the Nueces, and knew how to make allowances for the exuberance of the Latin tongue. There was no telling to what extent Enrique could have kept on delivering messages, but to his employer he was avoiding the issue. But did you get to see Anita? interrupted Uncle Lance. Yes, he had seen her, but that was about all. Did not Don Lance know the customs among the Castilians? There was her mother ever present, or, if she must absent herself, there was a bevy of Tia's comrades surrounding her until the Donna Anita dared not even to raise her eye to meet his. To perdition with such customs, no. The freedom of a cow camp is a splendid opportunity to relieve one's mind upon prevailing injustices. Don't fret your cattle so early in the morning, son, admonished the wary matchmaker. I've handled worse cases than this before. You Mexicans are sticklers on customs and we must deal with our neighbors carefully. Before I show my hand in this, there's just one thing I want to know. Is the girl willing? Whenever you can satisfy me on that point, Enrique, just call on the old man. But before that, I won't step. You remember what a time I had over Tribucio's Juan? That's so. You were too young then. Well, June here remembers it. Why, the girl just cut up shamefully called Juan an Indian peon, and bragged about her Castilian family until you'd have supposed she was a princess of the blood royal. Why, it took her parents and myself a whole day 
to bring the girl around to take a sensible view of the matters. On my soul, except that I didn't want to acknowledge defeat, I felt a dozen times like telling her to go straight up. And when she did marry you, she was as happy as a lark, wasn't she, Juan? And I'd like to have the thing over with in, well, let's say half an hour's time. Then we can have refreshments and smoke and discuss the prospects of the young couple. Uncle Lance's question was hard to answer. Enrique had known the girl for several years, had danced with her on many a feast day, and never lost an opportunity to whisper the old, old story in her willing ear. Others had done the like, but the dark-eyed senorita is an adept in the art of coquetry, and there you are. But Enrique swore a great oath that he would know. Yes, he would. He would lay siege to her, as he had never done before. He would become un oso grande. Just wait until the branding was over and the fiestas of the Christmas season were on, and watch him dog her every step until he received her signal of surrender. Witness, all the saints, this row of Enrique Lopez. That the Donna Anita should have no peace of mind, no, not for one little minute, until she had made a complete capitulation. Then Don Lance, the padrino of Las Palomas, would at once write the letter, which would command the hand of the corporal's daughter, who could refuse such a request. And what was a daughter of Santa Maria compared to the son of Las Palomas? Turncalis Creek ran almost due east, and Ranchero Santa Maria was located near its source, depending more on its wells for water supply than on the stream which only flowed for a few months during the year. Where the watering facilities were so limited, the rodeo was an easy matter. A number of small roundups at each established watering point, a swift cutting out of everything bearing the Las Palomas brand, and we moved on to the next rodeo, for we had an abundance of help at Santa Maria. The work was finished by the middle of the afternoon. After sending, under five or six men, our cut of several hundred cattle westward on our course, our outfit rode into Rancho Santa Maria proper to pay our respects. Our wagon had provided an abundant dinner for our assistants and ourselves, but it would have been, in Mexican etiquette, extremely rude on our part not to visit the ranchero and partake of a cup of coffee and a cigarette, thanking the ranchero on parting for his kindness in granting us the rodeo. So when the last roundup was reached, Don Mateo and Uncle Lance turned the work over to their corporals, and in advance rode up to Santa Maria. The vaqueros of our ranch were anxious to visit the ranchero, so it developed on the white element to take charge of the cut. Being a stranger to Santa Maria, I was allowed to accompany our segundo, June Deweese, on an introductory visit. On arriving at the ranch, the vaqueros scattered among the locales of their amigos, while June and myself were welcomed at the Casa Primero. There we found Uncle Lance partaking of refreshments, and smoking a cigarette as though he had been born a senior don of some ruling hacienda. June and I were seated at another table, where we were served with coffee, wafers, and homemade cigarettes. This was perfectly in order, but I could hardly control myself over the extravagant Spanish our employer was using in expressing the amity existing between Santa Maria and Las Palomas. In ordinary conversation, such as cattle and ranch affairs, Uncle Lance had a good command of Spanish, but on social and delicate topics some of his efforts were ridiculous in the extreme. He was well aware of his shortcomings, and frequently appealed to me to assist him. As a boy, my playmates had been Mexican children, so that I not only spoke Spanish fluently, but could also readily read and write it. So it was no surprise to me that, before taking our departure, my employer should command my services as an interpreter in driving an entering wedge. He was particular to have me assure our host and hostess of his high regard for them, and his hope that in the future even more friendly relations might exist 
between the two ranches. Had Santa Maria no young cavalier for the hand of some daughter of Las Palomas? Ah, there was the true bond of future friendship. Well, well, if the soil of this ranchero was so impoverished, then the sons of Las Palomas must take the bit in their teeth and come courting to Santa Maria, and let Donna Gregoria look well to her daughters. For the young men of Las Palomas, true to their race, were not only handsome fellows, but ardent lovers, and would be hard to refuse. After taking our leave and catching up with the cattle, we pushed westward for the Ganso, our next stream of water. This creek was a tributary to the Nueces, and we worked down it several days, or until we had nearly a thousand cattle and were within thirty miles of home. Turning this cut over to June Deweese and a few vaqueros to take into the ranch and brand, the rest of us turned westward and struck the Nueces at least fifty miles above Las Palomas. For the next few days our dragnet took in both sides of the Nueces, when, on reaching the mouth of the Ganso, we were met by Deweese and the vaqueros. We had another bunch of nearly a thousand ready. Dan Happersat was dispatched with the second bunch for branding. When we swung north to Mr. Booth's ranch on the Frio, where we rested for a day, but there is little recreation on a cow hunt, and we were soon under full headway again. By the time we had worked down the Frio, opposite headquarters, we had too large a herd to carry conveniently, and I was sent in home with them, never rejoining the outfit until they reached Shepherd's Ferry. This was a disappointment to me, for I had hopes that when the outfit worked the range around the mouth of San Miguel, I might find some excuse to visit the McLeod Ranch and see Esther. But after turning back up the home river to within twenty miles of the ranch, we again turned southward, covering the intervening ranches rapidly until we struck the Tarancalis about twenty-five miles east of Santa Maria. We had spent over thirty days in making this circle, gathering over five thousand cattle, about one-third of which were cows with calves by their sides. On the remaining gap in the circle, we lost two days in waiting for rodeos, or gathering independently along the Terran Callis, and, on nearing the Santa Maria range, we had nearly fifteen hundred cattle. Our herd passed within plain view of the ranchero but we did not turn aside, preferring to make a dry camp for the night, some five or six miles further on our homeward course. But since we had used the majority of our remuda very hard that day, Uncle Lance dispatched Enrique and myself with our wagon and saddle horses by way of Santa Maria to water our saddle stock and refill our kegs for camping purposes. Of course, the compliments of our employer to the ranchero of Santa Maria went with the remuda and wagon. I delivered the compliments and its regrets to Don Mateo, and asked permission to water our saddle stock, which was readily granted. This required some time, for we had about a hundred and twenty-five loose horses with us, and the water had to be raised by rope and pulley from the pommel of a saddle horse. After watering the team, we refilled our kegs, and the cook pulled out to overtake the herd, Enrique and I staying to water the remuda. Enrique, who was riding the saddle horse, while I emptied the buckets as they were hoisted to the surface, was evidently killing time. By his dilatory tactics, I knew the young rascal was delaying in the hope of getting a word with the Donna Anita. But it was getting late, and at the rate we were hoisting, darkness would overtake us before we could reach the herd. So I ordered Enrique to the bucket, while I took my own horse and furnished the hoisting power. We were making some headway with the work when a party of women, among them the Donna Anita, came down to the well to fill vessels for house use. This may have been all chance, and then again it may not, but the gallant Enrique now outdid himself filling jar after jar and lifting them to the shoulder of the bearer with the utmost zeal and amid a profusion of compliments. I was annoyed at the interruption in our work, 
but I could see that Enrique was now in the highest heaven of delight. The Donna Anita's mother was present, and made it her duty to notice that only commonplace formalities passed between her daughter and the ardent vaquero. After the jars were all filled, the bevy of women started on their return, but Donna Anita managed to drop a few feet to the rear of the procession, and, looking back, quietly took up one corner of her mantilla, and, with a little movement, apparently all innocence, flashed the message back to the entranced Enrique. I was aware of the flirtation, but before I had made more of it, Enrique sprang down from the abutment of the well, dragging me from my horse, and, in an ecstasy of joy, crouching behind the abutments, cried, Had I seen the sign? Had I not noticed her token? Was my brain then so befuddled? Did I not understand the ways of the senoritas among his people, that they always answered by a wave of the handkerchief, or the mantilla? Ave Maria, Tomas! Such stupidity! Why, to be sure, they could talk all day with their eyes. The setting sun finally ended his confidences, and the watering was soon finished, for Enrique lowered the bucket in a gallop. On our reaching the herd, and while we were catching our night horses, Uncle Lance strode out to the rope corral, with the inquiry, what had delayed us? Nothing particular, I replied, and looked at Enrique, who shrugged his shoulders and repeated my answer. Now look here, you young liars, said the old ranchero. The wagon has been in camp over an hour, and admitting it did start before you, you had plenty of time to water the saddle stock and overtake it before it could possibly reach the herd. I can tell a lie myself, but a good one always has some plausibility. You rascals were up to some mischief, I'll warrant. I had caught out my night horse, and as I led him away to saddle up, Uncle Lance, not content with my evasive answer, followed me. Go to Enrique, I whispered. He'll just bubble over at a good chance to tell you. Yes, it was Donna Anita who caused the delay. A smothered chuckling shook the old man's frame as he sauntered over to where Enrique was saddling. As the two let off the horse to picket in the gathering dust, the ranchero had his arm around the vaquero's neck, and I felt that the old matchmaker would soon be in possession of the facts. A hilarious guffaw that reached me as I was picketing my horse announced that the story was out, and as the two returned to the fire, Uncle Lance was slapping Enrique on the back at every step and calling him a lucky dog. The news spread through the camp like wildfire, even to the vaqueros on night herd, who instantly began chanting an old love song. When Enrique and I were eating our supper, our employer paced back and forward in meditation, like a sentinel on picket, and when we had finished our meal, he joined us around the fire, inquiring of Enrique how soon the demand should be made for the corporal's daughter and was assured that it could not be done too soon. The padre only came once a year, he concluded, and they must be ready. Well, now, this is a pretty pickle, said the old matchmaker, as he pulled his gray mustaches. There isn't a pen or paper in the outfit, and then we'll be busy branding on the home range for a month, and I can't spare a vaquero a day to carry a letter to Santa Maria. And besides, I might not be at home when the reply came. I think I'll just take the bull by the horns, ride back in the morning, and set these old precedents at defiance, by arranging the match verbally. I can make the talk that this country is Texas now, and that under the new regime American customs are in order. That's what I'll do, and I'll take Tom Quirk with me for fear I bog down in my Spanish. But several vaqueros who understood some English advised Enrique of what the old matchmaker proposed to do, when the vaquero threw his hands in the air and began sputtering Spanish in terrified disapproval. Did not Don Lance know that the marriage usage among his people were their most cherished customs? Oh, yes, son, languidly replied Uncle Lance. I'm some strong on the cherish myself, but not when it interferes with my plans. It strikes me that less than a month ago, I heard you condemning to perdition certain customs of your people. Now don't get on too high a horse. Just leave it to Tom and me. 
We may stay a week, but when we come back, we'll bring your betrothal with us in our vest pockets. There was never a Mexican born who can outhold me on palaver, and we'll eat every chicken on Santa Maria unless they surrender. As soon as the herd had started for home the next morning, Uncle Lance and I returned to Santa Maria. We were extended a cordial reception by Don Mateo, and after the chronicle of happenings since the two rancheros last met had been reviewed, the motive of our sudden return was mentioned. By combining the vocabularies of my employer and myself, we mentioned our errand as delicately as possible, pleading guilty and craving everyone's pardon for our rudeness in verbally conducting the negotiations. To our surprise, for the Mexicans' customs are as rooted as faith, Don Mateo took no offense and summoned Donna Gregoria. I was playing a close second to the diplomat of our side of the house, and when his Spanish failed him and he had recourse to English, it is needless to say I handled the matters to the best of my ability. The Spanish is a musical, passionate language, and well suited to love-making, and though this was my first use of it for that purpose, within half an hour we had won the ranchero and his wife to our side of the question. Then, at Don Mateo's orders, the parents of the girl were summoned. This involved some little delay, which permitted coffee being served, and discussion, over the cigarettes, of the commonplace matters of the country. There was beginning to be a slight demand for cattle to drive to the far north on the trails. Some thought it was a sign of a big development but neither of the rancheros put much confidence in the movement, etc., etc. The corporal and his wife suddenly made their appearance, dressed in their best, which accounted for the delay, and all cattle conversation instantly ceased. Uncle Lance rose and greeted the husky corporal and his timid wife with warm cordiality. I extended my greetings to the Mexican foreman, whom I had met at the rodeo about a month before. We then resumed our seats, but the corporal and his wife remained standing, and with elegant command of his native tongue, Don Mateo informed the couple of our mission. They looked at each other in bewilderment. Tears came into the wife's eyes. For a moment I pitied her. Indeed, the pathetic was not lacking. But the hardy corporal reminded his better half that her parents, in his interests, had once been asked for her hand under similar circumstances and the tears disappeared. Tears are womanly, and I have since seen them shed, under less provocation, by fairer-skinned women than this simple, swarthy daughter of Mexico. It was but natural that the parents of the girl should feign surprise and reluctance if they did not feel it. The Donna Anita's mother offered several trivial objections. Her daughter had never taken her into her confidence over any suitor. And did Anita really love Enrique Lopez of Las Palomas? Even if she did, could he support her being but a vaquero? This brought Uncle Lance to the front. He had known Enrique since the day of his birth. As a five-year-old, naked as the day he was born, had he not ridden a colt at branding time twice around the big corral without being thrown? At ten, had he not thrown himself across the gateway and allowed a caballada of over two hundred wild-range horses to jump over his prostrate body as they passed in a headlong rush through the gate. Only the year before at Branding, when an infuriated bull had driven every vaquero out of the corrals, did not Enrique mount his horse and, after baiting the bull out into the open, play with him like a kitten with a mouse. And when the bull, tiring, attempted to make his escape, who but Enrique had lassoed the animal by the forefeet, breaking his neck in the throw. The diplomat of Las Palomas dejectedly admitted that the bull was a prize animal, but could not deny that he himself had joined in the plaudits to the daring vaquero. But if there was a possible doubt that Donna Anita did not love this son of Las Palomas, then Lance Lovelace himself would oppose the union. This was an important matter. Would Don Mateo be so kind as to summon the senorita? The senorita came in response to the summons. She was a girl of possibly seventeen summers, several inches taller than her mother. 
possessing a beautiful complexion with large, lustrous eyes. There was something fawn-like in her timidity as she gazed at those about the table. Donna Gregoria broke the news, informing her that the ranchero of Las Palomas had asked her hand in marriage for Enrique, one of his vaqueros. Did she love the man, and was she willing to marry him? For reply, the girl hid her face in the mantilla of her mother. With commendable tact, Donna Gregoria led the mother and daughter into another room, from which the two elder women soon returned with a favorable reply. Uncle Lance arose and assured the corporal and his wife that their daughter would receive his special care and protection as long as the water ran and grass grew. Las Palomas would care for her own children. We accepted an invitation to remain for dinner, as several hours had elapsed since our arrival. In company with the corporal, I attended to our horses, leaving the two rancheros absorbed in a discussion of Texas fever, rumors of which were then attracting widespread attention in the north along the cattle trails. After dinner, we took our leave of host and hostess, promising to send Enrique to Santa Maria at the earliest opportunity. It was a long ride across the country to Las Palomas, but striking a free gate, unencumbered as we were, we covered the country rapidly. I had somewhat doubted the old matchmaker's sincerity in making this match, but as we rode along he told me of his own marriage to Mary Bryan, and the one happy year of life which it brought him, mellowing into a mood of seriousness which dispelled all doubts. It was almost sunset when we sighted in the distance the ranch buildings at Las Palomas, and half an hour later, as we galloped up to assist the herd which was nearing the corrals, the old man stood in his stirrups and, waving his hat, shouted to his outfit, Hurrah for Enrique and the Donna Anita! And as the last of the cattle entered the corral, a rain of lassos settled over the smiling rascal and his horse, and we led him in triumph to the house for Miss Jean's blessing. End of chapter 3「Four of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christmas. The branding on the home range was an easy matter. The cattle were compelled to water from the oasis, so that their range was never over five or six miles from the river. There was no occasion even to take out the wagon, though we made a one-night camp at the mouth of the Gonzo, and another about midway between the home ranch and Shepherd's Ferry, pack mules serving instead of the wagon. On the home range, in gathering the brand, we never disturbed the mixed cattle, cutting out only the cows and calves. On the roundup below the Gonso, we had over three thousand cattle in one rodeo, finding less than five hundred calves belonging to Las Palomas, the bulk on this particular occasion being steer cattle. There had been little demand for steers for several seasons, and they had accumulated until many of them were fine beeves, five and six years old. When the branding proper was concluded, our tally showed nearly fifty-one hundred calves branded that season, indicating about twenty thousand cattle in the Las Palomas brand. After a week's rest with fresh horses, we re-rode the home range in squads of two and branded any calves we found with a running iron. This added nearly a hundred more to our original number. On an open range like ours, it was not expected that everything would be branded, but on quitting, it is safe to say, we had missed less than one per cent of our calf crop. The cattle finished, we turned our attention to the branding of the horse stock. The Christmas season was approaching, and we wanted to get the work well in hand for the usual holiday festivities. There were some fifty manadas of mares belonging to Las Palomas, about one-fourth of which were used for the rearing of mules, the others growing our saddle horses for ranch use. These brands numbered twenty to twenty-five brood mares each, and ranged mostly within twenty miles of the home ranch. They were never disturbed except to brand the colts, market surplus stock, 
or cut out the mature geldings to be broken for saddle use. Each manada had its own range, never trespassing on the other, but when they were brought together in the corral, there was many a battle royal among the stallions. I was anxious to get the work over in good season, for I intended to ask for two weeks' leave of absence. My parents lived near Cibolo Ford on the San Antonio River, and I made it a rule to spend Christmas with my own people. This year in particular I had a double motive in going home, for the mouth of the San Miguel and the McLeod Ranch lay directly on my route. I had figured matters down to a fraction. I would have a good excuse for staying one night and going and another returning, and it would be my fault if I did not reach the ranch at an hour when an invitation to remain overnight would be simply imperative under the canons of Texas hospitality. I had done enough hard work since the dance at Shepherd's to drive every thought of Esther McLeod out of my mind if that were possible, but as the time drew nearer, her invitation to call was ever uppermost in my thoughts. So when the last of the horse stock was branded, and the work was drawing to a close, as we sat around the fireplace one night, and the question came up where each of us was expected to spend Christmas, I broached my plan. The master and mistress were expected at the Booth Ranch on the Frio. Nearly all the boys who had homes within two or three days' ride hoped to improve the chance to make a short visit to their people. When, among the others, I also made my application for leave of absence. Uncle Lance turned in his chair with apparent surprise. What's that? You want to go home? Well, now, that's a new one on me. Why, Tom, I never knew you had any folks. I got the idea somehow that you was one on a horse race. Here I had everything figured out to send you down to Santa Maria with Enrique, but I reckon with the ice broken, he'll have to swim out or drown. Where do your folks live? I explained that they lived on the San Antonio River, northeast, about 150 miles. At this I saw my employer's face brighten. Yes, yes, I see, he said musingly. That will carry you past the widow McLeod's. You can go, son, and good luck to you. I timed my departure from Las Palomas, allowing three days for the trip, so as to reach home on Christmas Eve. By making a slight deviation, there was a country store which I could pass on the last day, where I expected to buy some presents for my mother and sisters. But I was in a pickle as to what to give Esther, and consulting Miss Jean, I found that the motherly elderly sister had everything thought out in advance. There was an old Mexican woman, a pure Aztec Indian, at a ranchita belonging to Las Palomas, who was an expert in Mexican drawn work. The mistress of the home ranch had been a good patron of this old woman, and the next morning we drove over to the ranchita, where I secured a half a dozen ladies' handkerchiefs, inexpensive but very rare. I owned a private horse, which had run idle all summer and naturally expected to ride him on this trip. But Uncle Lance evidently wanted me to make a good impression on the widow McLeod, and brushed my plans aside by asking me as a favor to ride a certain black horse belonging to his private string. Quirk, he said, the evening before my departure, I wish you would ride Wolf, that black six-year-old in my mount. When that rascal of an Enrique saddle broke him for me, he always mounted him with a free head and on the move, and now when I use him, he's always on the fidget. So you just ride him over to San Antonio and back, and see if you can't cure him of that restlessness. It may be my years, but I just despise a horse that's always dancing a jig when I want to mount him. Glenn Gallup's people lived in Victoria County, about as far from Las Palomas as mine, and the next morning we set out down the river. Our course together only led a short distance, but we jogged along until noon, when we rested an hour and parted. Glenn, going on down the river for Oakville, while I turned almost due north across country for the mouth of the San Miguel. The black carried me that afternoon as though the saddle were empty. I was constrained to hold him in, in view of the long journey before us. 
so as not to reach the McLeod Ranch too early. Whenever we struck cattle on our course, I rode through them to pass away the time, and just about sunset I cantered up to the McLeod Ranch with a dash. I did not know a soul on the place, but put on a bold front and asked for Miss Esther. On catching sight of me, she gave a little start, blushed modestly, and greeted me cordially. Texas hospitality of an early day is too well known to need comment. I was at once introduced to the McLeod household. It was rather a pretentious ranch, somewhat dilapidated in appearance. Appearances are as deceitful on a cattle ranch as in the cut of a man's coat. Tony Hunter, a son-in-law of the widow, was foreman on the ranch, and during the course of the evening in the discussion of cattle matters, I innocently drew out the fact that their branded calf crop of that season amounted to nearly three thousand calves. When a similar question was asked me, I reluctantly admitted that the Las Palomas crop was quite a disappointment this year, only branding 6,500 calves, but that our mule and horse colts ran nearly a thousand head without equals in the Nueces Valley. I knew there was no one there who could dispute my figures, though Mrs. McLeod expressed surprise at them. You do not say, said my hostess, looking directly at me over her spectacles, that Las Palomas branded that many calves this year. Why, during my good man's life, we always branded more calves than did Mr. Lovelace. But then my husband would join the army, and I had to depend on the greasers to do my work. And our key grew up mavericks. I said nothing in reply, knowing it to be quite natural for a woman or inexperienced person to feel always the prey of the fortunate and far-seeing. The next morning before leaving, I managed to have a nice private talk with Miss Esther, and thought I read my title clear, when she surprised me with the information that her mother contemplated sending her off to San Antonio to a private school for young ladies. Her two elder sisters had married against her mother's wishes, it seemed, and Mrs. McLeod was determined to give her youngest daughter an education and fit her for something better than being the wife of a common cow-hand. This was the inference from the conversation which passed between us at the gate. But when Esther thanked me for the Christmas remembrance I had brought her, I felt that I would take a chance on her, win or lose. Assuring her that I would make it a point to call on my return, I gave the black a free rein and galloped out of sight. I reached home late on Christmas Eve. My two elder brothers also followed cattle work, and had arrived the day before, and the Quirk family were once more united, for the first time in two years. Within an hour of my arrival, I learned from my brothers that there was to be a dance that night at a settlement about fifteen miles up the river. They were going, and it required no urging on their part to ensure the presence of the Quirk's three boys. Supper over, a fresh horse was furnished me, and we set out for the dance, covering the distance in less than two hours. I knew everyone in the settlement, and got a cordial welcome. I played the fiddle, danced with my former sweethearts, and, ere the sun rose in the morning, rode home in time for breakfast. During that night's revelry, I contrasted my former girlfriends on the San Antonio with another maiden, a slip of the old Scotch stock, transplanted and nurtured in the sunshine and soil of the San Miguel. The comparison stood all tests applied, and in my secret heart I knew who held the whip-hand over the passions within me. As I expected to return to Las Palomas for the new year, my time was limited to four days' visit at home. But a great deal can be said in four days, and at the end I was ready to saddle my black, bid my adieus, and ride for the southwest. During my visit I was careful not to betray that I had even a passing thought of a sweetheart, and what parents would suspect that a rollicking carefree young fellow of twenty could have any serious intentions towards a girl. With brothers too indifferent and sisters too young, the secret was my own. Though Wolf, my mount, as he put mile after mile behind us, seemed conscious that his mission to reach the San Miguel 
without loss of time, was more than ordinary moment, and a better horse never carried night in the days of chivalry. On reaching the McLeod Ranch during the afternoon of the second day, I found Esther expectant, but the welcome of her mother was of a frigid order. Having a Scotch mother myself, I knew something of arbitrary natures, and met Mrs. McLeod's coolness with a fund of talk and stories, yet I could see all too plainly that she was determinedly on the defensive. I had my favorite fiddle with me, which I was taking back to Las Palomas, and during the evening I played all the old Scotch ballads I knew and love songs of the Highlands, hoping to soften her from the decided stand she had taken against me and my intentions. But her heritage of obstinacy was large, and her opposition strong, as several well-directed thrusts which reached me in vulnerable places made me aware. But I smiled as if they were flattering compliments. Several times I mentally framed replies only to smother them, for I was a stranger within her gates, and if she saw fit to offend a guest, she was still within her rights. But the next morning, as I tarried beyond the reasonable hour for my departure, her wrath broke out in a torrent. "'If you do not know the way home, Mr. Quirk, I'll show it to you,' she said, as she joined Esther and me at the hitch-rack, where we had been loitering for an hour. "'And I do not care much where you're going. So you get out of my sight and stay out of it. I thought you were a civil stranger when you bided with us last week, but now I ken ye are something more, riding your fine horses and making presents to me lassie. That's the good that comes from letting her to go to every dance at Shepherd's Ferry. Go back the house to your work, you jade, and let me attend to this fine gentleman. No, sir. Gin your only business somewhere else. You'd better be riding to it, for you are not wanted here, you can. Why, Mrs. McLeod, I broke in politely, you hardly know anything about me. No, and I don't not wish to. You are from Las Palomas, and that's all enough for me. I ken old Lance Lovelace, and those that bid with him. Small wonder he brands so many calves, and sells more key than other ranchmen in the country. Ay, man, I ken him well. I saw that I had a tartar to deal with. But if I could switch her invective on some one absent, it would assist me in controlling myself. So I said to the old lady, Why, well, I've known Mr. Lovelace now almost a year. And over on the oasis he is well liked and considered a cowman whose word is as good as gold. What have you got against him? Oh, much, my young friend. I knew him before you were born. I'm sorry to say that while my goodman was alive, he was a frequent visitor at our place. But we didn't see him only near. He always keeps away from here and camps with his wagons when he's over on the San Miguel to gather cattle. He was no content merely with what key drifted down on the Nueces, but worked the big outfit the year around, even coming over on the Frio and San Miguel Maverick Hunt. That's why he brands twice the calves that anybody else does, and owns forty miles front land on both sides of the river. You see, I ken him well. Well, isn't that the way most cowmen got their start? I innocently inquired, well knowing it was. And do you blame him for running his brand on the unowned cattle that roam the range? I expect if Mr. Lovelace was my father instead of my employer, you wouldn't be talking in the same key. And with that I led my horse out to mount. You think a great deal of yourself because you're from Las Palomas. Away, no vaquero of old Lance Lovelace can come sparkin' with me lass. I've heard old Lovelace matchmaking. I'm told he makes matches and then laughs at the silly guacs. I've two worthless son-in-laws that nope are here and neither a stage driver. And they're capital husbands for Donna McLee's lassies, are they? No. And before I let Esther marry the first scamp that come simpering round here, I'll put her in a convent and make a nun of the baron. I gave the other lassies their way and look at the reward 
I tell you, I'm going to bar the door on the last one, and the man that marries her will be worthy of her. He will not be a vaccaro from Las Palomas either. I had mounted my horse to start, well knowing it was useless to argue with an angry woman. Esther had obediently retreated to the safety of the house, aware that her mother had a tongue and evidently willing to be spared its invective in my presence. My horse was fidgeting about, impatient to be off, but I gave him the rowel and rode up to the gate, determined, if possible, to pour oil on the troubled waters. Mrs. McLeod, said I, in humble tones, possibly, you take the correct view of this matter. Miss Esther and I have only been acquainted a few months, and will soon forget each other. Please take me in the house and let me tell her good-bye. No, sir, do not set a foot inside this gate. I hope you know you are not wanted here. There's your road, the one leading south, and you'd better be going, I'm thinking. I held in the black and rode off in a walk. This was the first clean knockout I had ever met. Heretofore, I had been egotistical enough to hold my head rather high, but this morning it drooped. Wolf seemed to notice it, and after a first mile, dropped into an easy volunteer walk. I never noticed the passing of time until we reached the river, and the black stopped to drink. Here I unsaddled for several hours, then went on again in no cheerful mood. Before I came within sight of Las Palomas, near evening, my horse turned his head and nickered, and in a few minutes Uncle Lance and June Deweese galloped up and overtook me. I had figured out several very plausible versions of my adventure, but this sudden meeting threw me off my guard, and Lance Lovelace was a hard man to tell an undetected, white-faced lie. I put on a bold front, but his salutation penetrated it at a glance. "'What's the matter, Tom? Any of your folks dead?' "'No.' "'Sick? No. Girl gone back on you? I don't think. It's the old woman, then. How do you know? Because I know that old dame. I used to go over there occasionally when old man Donald was living. But the old lady, excuse me, I ought to have posted you, Tom, but I don't suppose it would have done any good. Brush your fiddle with you, I see. That's good. I expect the old lady read my title clear to you. My brain must have been under a haze, for I repeated every charge she had made against him, not even sparing the accusation that he had remained out of the army and added to his brand by mavericking cattle. Did she say that? inquired Uncle Lance, laughing. Why, the old hellion! She must have been feeling in fine fettle. End of chapter 4